Welcome to the GCN Tech Clinic, where we aim to answer your bike and cycling and tech related questions. You can submit your questions using the hashtag AskGCNTech in the comments section below and also on social media and under other videos. Without further ado, let's begin this week's episode. So the first question is from Campbell Lewis, who says, I have a Colnago Ace carbon frame with regular dropouts, 5034, 2512 cassette. Um, is it possible to convert this to a fixie or a single speed using largely the existing parts, like the chain ring on it, one of the cassette rings, keep, keep the same wheels? How can I work with dropouts on it because it doesn't have track dropouts or horizontal dropouts? Um, yes, the problem you've got there is creating sufficient chain tension if you do try and convert that into a fixie or a single speed. It's a problem I sort of had when I did my single speed conversion of the uh, Cervelo, but that did have a slight kind of almost half a track dropout that was slightly horizontal. Because you've got a regular dropout on that bike, you're going to need to somehow tension the chain. Now, you can use a half link chain that could get you around that problem but I think you might still struggle, in which case you'd probably have to fit a chain tensioner in place of the rear mech. Or you could use an eccentric hub uh, is another option as well, which is again, a bit of a neater solution than using a, a chain tensioner um, as it just creates a sort of cleaner look on the bike. So there are your options. In terms of turning it into a fixie, I think you're gonna struggle. Well, it is possible, but you're gonna need a complete new rear wheel. You won't be able to use that existing free hub wheel. You'll only be able to turn that into a single speed. But if you do get a single speed conversion kit, like I did with the spacers that go on to the free hub body, and then a single ring that goes on there, you should be able to use your existing parts and get that to work. Although you will have to realign your front chain ring so that it's the correct chain line. Um, usually what you can do is take off the outer chain ring and move it to the inner position. On some chain sets, you won't be able to do this, but on a lot of older ones, you can. So I guess you'll have to see with your, your chain set if that's possible. But yeah, let us know how you get on and make sure you submit your conversion when you do it in the, in the app, in the upgrade section. We might put it in the GCN Tech Show. Uh, next one is from Daniel Corfel, who says, I'm trying to determine a better riding, uh, indoor riding option for winter. He says his wife, seems to like Peloton, but he's interested in a smart trainer. What is the difference between a smart trainer and interactive cycling bikes like a Peloton? Well, great question. And it's one that I've been getting asked quite a lot by friends who are in the exact same position. And basically I would say a smart trainer, like a Wahoo Kicker, for example, is a far more versatile option. Um, it offers more options with it. You can do more with it. You can put any bike on it. You can um, also use different apps. So you could use Zwift, you could use Trainer Road, you could use Sufferfest, whatever you like, or Ruby or any of the other ones we've looked at, um, which is great, it means there's loads of different options for you. Whereas if you use Peloton, you're tied into Peloton. Uh, the advantage of a Peloton bike is I'd say it's, it's less intimidating to non-cyclists. It's also a kind of more accessible option, I think, and people who don't identify as cyclists, but perhaps do identify with wanting to be fitter, maybe they identify with spinning classes in the gym, but not necessarily going out on a Sunday wearing loads of Lycra. Um, it can be a more attractive option for those people. Um, it's also simple, a bit like an old iMac you would buy in the late 90s. It all just comes out the box and it's there. Whereas it can be a bit more complicated for people who aren't cyclists to understand that you have to get a bike, you have to get a turbo, you have to get a few other bits and pieces to get it all to work. That's a bit like kind of, you know, getting a high spec gaming PC in the 90s versus like an iMac. Maybe it's a bit like that. You get the idea. Um, overall, I would say the smart trainer is a much better way to go. And then also it means that if you do, you know, get your, your other half a, a bike, they can stick that on the smart trainer and use that. But then also have the added bonus option of going for a bike ride, perhaps sometime uh, actually outside as well, which is, uh, which is great. So yeah, I would definitely go down the smart trainer route. Also because smart trainers, like a Wahoo Kicker, has an actual power meter on it that measures actual watts and can do other things. Whereas like a Peloton bike, it's just like guesstimating your watts. So not quite, not quite as good, it's like estimated power. 
But anyway, uh, next question. I hope that answers your question. Uh, Mark Bulmer says, hi, Ollie. My question is, how can I get a faster average speed over a ride of 20 to 40 miles? I'm currently averaging about 18 miles an hour, but I can't get to 20 mile an hour average. Please help me. Well, get aero. That's the simple thing. Get more aero and you'll do it. Um, also, you could watch our vid on how to increase your average speed. Uh, Hank and Manon did one, it's great. But overall, I mean, I'd say don't be too fixated on average speed because it changes with so many variables. Is it a really windy day? That'll slow you down. You know, it, where are you riding? That'll, that'll slow you down. People often comment on my rides on, you know, Strava and things saying about the average speed, but it's not something I ever look at really because I'm more interested in other things. Sometimes I'll do a ride where my average power, so the amount I've tried is really high and I've really pushed myself and ridden really hard. But because I've been riding in a really hilly area, my average speed isn't that great. But other times I'll ride really easy, but somewhere dead flat and have a much higher average speed and people will give me more kudos because they think that's a better ride. The reality is it isn't. Um, so yes, I wouldn't be too fixated on, on your average speed all the time as well. That'd be my other bit of advice, but uh, yeah, happy riding, but definitely get more aero. Eric Berman says, not sure if this is a tech question or not, but why don't any of the GCM presenters wear gloves when they ride? It is a tech question because, I mean, clothing counts as tech. Um, I per prefer not wearing them. A simple answer is that. Um, I know a lot of the other presenters feel, feel the same as well. That's why we don't. Um, and I, I speak for the other presenters when I say if, if we have cold hands, we will wear gloves because no one likes having cold hands. But it's often quite mild in the UK, even in winter. And I would also wear mitts but only if I was racing. And the reason why I'd wear mitts is just to protect my hands. So fingerless gloves, mitts, um, to protect my hands in case you fall off your bike when you're racing. And there's an added risk when you're racing that you might fall off. And you'll see a lot of professional riders in the Tour de France wearing mitts for that exact reason. Uh, but when they're out training again, they don't, they don't tend to wear them. But it, it just comes down to personal preference. If you're comfortable and you like the feeling of mitts all the time, wear them all the time. Um, other professionals do that as well. So, you know, Whatever, whatever you like. I just like the, the freedom of not having anything on my hands. I just prefer the feeling on the bars and stuff. But there you go. Uh, Paul Chewett says, I have a 2020 Merida Sculptura 8000E, nice bike, with DI2 on the stem and uh, like strapped under the stem, I'm guessing. A little old junction box on the old style DI2. And then just a separate stem and handlebar combo. Can I change this to an integrated cockpit do I need to consider anything for compatibility? Also, will the bike police arrest me for putting an aero bar on a climbing bike? Absolutely not. Aero bar on a climbing bike, I think that's an awesome combo. I'm also a big fan of aero wheels on a climbing bike. But yeah, what, what you can do, get an aero cockpit, bang it on, a bit like I've got like this aero cockpit on my Pinarello, but what I'd suggest you do is upgrade your junction box. So instead of having the normal rectangular junction box, the old style one that would hang underneath the stem, get the bar end one and then route your cables through there. And then you should have a slot where you can pull out, the cables will come out in the middle of the stem and you can neatly route them into the frame on your uh, Merida Sculptura as well. So yeah, I would absolutely do that. But I think the, the key thing is to get the different junction box and then slot that into the bar end one. The bar end one is really neat. Uh, next question, which ties in nicely to Paul's question, comes from Davos Lunasby, who says, zip ties are the worst. Any elegant solutions for securing a DI2 wire to a brake hose coming out of the headset? Um, so when you've got like a, a wire like this hanging out the front of the, the bike and you've also got um, a DI2 cable, I don't have that in this case, but it's in the DI2 cable goes through here. But in that instance, yes, there are neat solutions. Now the way the pros often do it, well, the pro mechanics for the pros, is they get some heat shrink uh, cable wrap around there. Um, you can pick this up from hardware stores or like electrical stores. Um, if you go there, they often have it. And it's a neat way of tidying up cables. It's actually intended for kind of like domestic use, like tidying up cables in your house, but it works great on bikes. It's a cool hack. I should probably do a maintenance video on it at some point. But you may need to take out, you may need to sort of disassemble your cables so that you can slide it 
over the top and then you simply get a hair dryer, warm it up and it like shrinks round onto the cables and like sucks in um, as you warm it up and it just, it looks really neat and tidy and uh, yeah, that's, that's the best way to do it. You could also get some electrical tape and really neatly wrap it round but it doesn't ever look as good, it always looks a bit more, more scruffy if you do that. Um, but yeah, again, let us know if you if you do that and submit it in the upgrade section. It'd be really cool to see. Last question this week comes from Ewan Kirk, who says, why have bike manufacturers started using Torx bolts? Anyone who's discovered themselves at the side of a road with a, with a loose Torx bolt and without a multi-tool that has a Torx bit on it has definitely cursed Torx bolts. The design of Torx bolts works better for high torque settings, but it seems pointless for seat posts and stem bolts, which are only like four to six newton meters. Man. Yep, I, uh, I'm right with you there, you and Kirk. I, I have to say, I, I do agree with, with what you're saying. For those who are unfamiliar, a Torx bolt, you might know it as like a star bolt. It's instead of a normal Allen key uh, socket or hex key socket, it's a little like star uh, bolt that you get. Now, these have actually been on bikes for a long time. It's not a new thing. They have been around a long time. They're actually, I think, first introduced in the 1960s as a replacement to Phillips heads. And they do have a number of advantages. So like you were saying, you're right. They are, you know, supposedly better for high torque applications. They're less likely to strip out or round out than a, than a conventional Allen key bolt. But this is only true if they're made from the same material. And what I've often found uh, in the past is that sometimes bike manufacturers in a bid to save weight, they will put on fancy like titanium alloy Torx bolts, which are like cheese and uh, round out very easily indeed, which is quite annoying. But there are other advantages as well. So they can, well, typically be lighter than a normal Allen key bolt and, and use less material, which saves a teeny weeny bit of weight. But I mean, as cyclists, we love saving teeny weeny bits of weight. Uh, and the other advantage is that they can actually have a lower profile head on the bolt than an Allen key bolt. Uh, this is, again, advantageous in certain design applications um, where the design would better suit that kind of bolt. So sometimes on like, you know, integrated uh, bits of bikes, you'll, you'll see that for that reason. That said, I'm not a fan. I mean, in the same way I'd like to live in a world where there are only, you know, there's only one bottom bracket standard, I would also quite like to live in a world where there's only hex key or Allen key bolts on bikes. I just think it makes life simpler and I'm all about anything for an easy life. But I don't see that happening anytime soon. So my multi-tool um, is this one, which is like a, it's a Topeak uh, Rocket Ratchet set. And it has a range of different attachments on it, including the Torx keys that I might need if I ever come across a bike that has that on it, because I ride quite a few different bikes. It's got different Allen key sizes and a handy like uh, torque wrench built into it. That's just a little pocket size one that you can carry around so that you're not gonna round out those bolts, which you should definitely be careful of doing. I hope that answers your question, uh, Ewan. But if I haven't been able to answer your question this week, I'm sorry, uh, that's all we've got time for, but keep them coming in using the hashtag AskGCNTech. It's always a pleasure to answer your questions. And as I say, that's all we've got time for this week, but we'll be back next week with another tech clinic. So we'll see you then. Bye.